Good morning, everyone, and thank you again for listening. This is Mark with Board of Faith Fellowship, and we have been going on this radio program covering of people who have almost died and have had near-death experiences, and God in His mercy, God in His love has saved people's lives. And so this is actually the third program we're doing now on this series of near-death experiences where God in his love save people's lives and so we have had many people from our church share on the last two programs and today we have many more who are going to share with you uh they come from all different places all different backgrounds but one thing they have in common is that if it wasn't for god's mercy they wouldn't be here today sharing because uh definitely they had experiences where they almost died and so I know we're glad that you're listening. As you listen, I want to encourage you to open your heart up and realize how big and how loving God is to look after you and I. So we're going to start off with Maggie. Maggie is here with us, and she has been part of our church for many, many years. You yes. came from Florida, and before that, you lived lots of different places, <laughs> yes, I know. I did. <laughs> uh, and so would you tell us about what God has done in your life and how he protected you? Yes. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Rutherford County. And I'm so excited and so grateful to be here to share with you the keeping power of God, his mercy, his love, and his kindness to me and his hand upon my life. Uh, I was not happy growing up at all. I had a very uh, horrible childhood. Uh, My family, they were not a church-going family. And even though my dad was raised Catholic, he still, uh, he hated God. There was no room in my heart, his heart, uh, you know, for God. So um, we could never talk about God in our house around him. So that made it a little bit difficult, although I never knew God. um, But still, there was something in me that knew somebody was out there. And so I always dreamt of a better life. I wanted to get away from my surroundings. So one day... I just decided I'm leaving. So I packed my car. I was 18 years old. I packed my car with everything, you know, that I could. Um, I did not know where my aunt lived in Florida. All I knew is I knew the town that she lived in. And I knew her last name. And so I just took off. And I started down the road. And I got onto the New Jersey Turnpike. And if anybody's been, has ever driven on the New Jersey Turnpike, they never want to go on it again. Because once you get on, you go for miles and miles and miles before there's an exit. So I did this, you know, I got on and I started driving and started driving. I knew I had a direction and that was south. And so I missed my exit. So I knew I was going to have to go and drive and drive and drive. So I did it again. I drove. And I found an exit many, many miles, you know, from the one that I missed. So I got on the, you know, turned around, got back on the New Jersey Turnpike and started heading for my exit again. Well, I came and, you know, started driving and driving. And then all of a sudden, I missed it again. I did this all day long. I didn't stop to eat. I didn't stop for anything. I was just so controlled by I've got to get to this exit. Uh So I got back on again and I started driving and driving. And then all of a sudden I was so exhausted. I fell asleep at the wheel. And I didn't know anything. I just fell asleep. And all of a sudden, there was a policeman, and he told me this afterwards. He, he drove by, you know, he was passing me. And then all of a sudden, he knew something was wrong with me. Mm-hmm. And so somehow he got it turned around and came back, and he started screaming at me. He started saying, wake up, wake up. He was honking his horn. He was blowing his siren. He, would, he, keep ye- he kept yelling at me and yelling at me to wake up, wake up. Well, I finally woke up, and he's you know, said, get your car onto the road because I was headed right for the bridge. I so was going to. So you're driving down the road asleep. Asleep. The officer's next to you, yeah. honking his horn, screaming, 
I, was he using his his siren? Oh yes, his... his siren was going. His horn was going. Uh-huh. He was screaming at me with everything in him to wake up. Right. And so I finally woke up. Where and were you heading if you did not wake up? Well, I was heading for the middle of the bridge. Okay. And that's what he saw. Right. You know, he saw me going. Right. So it was a second of time, you know, for him to be able to see that and then right. come and then just start screaming and, you know, helping me to right. get back on the road. Well, I finally woke up and I knew that was God. God got a hold of me to right. wake me up. Right. Otherwise... I'd have been dead and I'd have gone to hell. Right. And after that, you know, I went back home, but my life didn't change. It just did not change, even from that that accident, you know, or could have been a near tragic. And so my aunt came and a couple of years later and she took me down to Florida. But my heart and you know, my heart didn't change, my life didn't change, I didn't change even at that point. In fact, in Florida my life got worse and worse than if you can think of it getting worse than almost near dying. But I got into so many situations that only God could have pulled me out. Only the mercy and, you know, grace of God could have pulled me out. And uh, my, my life really started to change when God in his mercy somehow got me to North Carolina. And God, the two things that I ever wanted in my life was to be loved and to have a family. And God brought me to the word of faith. He's given me Mama Jane and Papa Sam for my mom and for my dad and all my family, all my brothers, all my sisters. Right. And I'm, I'm changing. I'm changing every day. And I'm so grateful and so thankful that God brought me here. I am too, and what a amazing testimony. The devil was after you he right was. then, and you were going just roaming and searching. And it sounds mm-hmm. like at that time in your life, you didn't really know God. Yeah. You you did, you did shared you grew up in a home where uh, even though your dad was Catholic, he didn't really serve God or yeah. gave his life to God. And so you, you didn't have a family where you learned about God. And so at that time in your life... Uh, God still was watching after you, That's and right. and on this program we've had so many other people uh, who who say the same thing. They didn't know God, but God was still looking after them. And isn't that amazing how God had mercy on your life yes, and my was. life and all our <laughs> lives? Um, so that is such a powerful testimony. Isn't that great that God was watching you on that road yes. when you were going down? He sent that policeman right there. He did. Amazing how he'll find somebody to help us That's even right. when we're going the wrong way. Isn't That's that true? That's right. That is so, so true. Powerful testimony, Maggie. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. And we are going to have the next person come and share, and we're going to keep moving this program along. You're going to hear from several people, and Mike is coming with us here. Um, and uh, Mike actually came to our church many years ago um, from Minnesota. Yes. Is that right, Mike? That's right. And uh, Mike actually shared his testimony, his full testimony on the radio program a while back. It was a powerful testimony. Uh, but I asked Mike to come back because uh, I know God spared Mike's life at a young age. And uh, it, it's a miracle that you're here today. Yes. I, I keep saying that to everybody that sits next to me. I say, it's a miracle you're here today after I hear all these <laughs> testimonies. But I'll say it to you. And so... Um, Mike, I, I definitely want you to share because I know the hand of God was on your life. Share yes, us it was. how God God protected you. Okay, Mark. There was actually two situations, but yeah. I'm going to share about this one. Mm-hmm. Um, this was about 1975, 76. I was about 11 years old, and uh, our family and some of my family and some other families and friends got together, and we were going to go tubing down the Apple River up in Minnesota. And um, so we went to the place, got our tubes, brought you know put them on the water and began tying them together so we could create like a raft. And so we floated down the river. And just to make a long story short, we, we got to the end point and um, we started untying our inner tubes. Mine was like the first one. So I was just kind of floating around there waiting for everybody else. And while I was floating around there, I started drifting downstream. Mm-hmm. And there were some cables that were stretched across, like three of them in different places there, so you could grab them to get off the river so you didn't go down through the white water. Mm-hmm. But I, um, at that age, I was a very good swimmer, and I loved the water. People used to call me a fish because I spent more time underwater than I did up. So mm-hmm. <laughs> I loved to swim. And uh, so I didn't have any fear of it. I thought, you know, that looks kind of interesting down there. And I really didn't think I was going to go that far, but I ended up drifting down that way. And as I did, 
there was this big rock about the size of two cars. It was flat rock in there. And I, I was heading toward that, and then I went around it because that's the way the current went. And as I was going around that rock, it, it had a little waterfall, two or three feet, not big. Mm-hmm. And uh, I hit that. When I did, my inner tube flipped out from underneath me, and the water falling down created like a vortex, like a horizontal vertical vortex. Right. And I got caught up in that, and I'm just flipping and flipping and flipping. And I open my eyes, and all I can see is white and bubbles, and, I, and I'm reaching out you know, with my arms and my legs trying to get a hold of something to grab a hold of to get out of that. I couldn't get a hold of anything. And um, there's a statement that a lot of people make when they had near-death experiences. They say their life flashes before them. That happened to me. So before that, I didn't understand it. But then I did. I realized that because my life flashed before me. I realized that's it. It's over. I'm going to die if something doesn't happen. Something doesn't change really quick. And about the time I was going through that, and that all happened just so quick. But it seemed like an eternity when you're in that situation. And so... Somebody grabbed my arm, pulled me up, and sat me on that rock. And I'm sitting there, you know, just catching my breath and trying to recover from what happened. And I turned around thinking I was going to tell my dad, you saved my life. And there was nobody there. Nobody was there. It's just You were just, you found yourself on top of a rock. On top yeah. of a rock. And, and it was a warm day. Right. The sun was shining. The, the rock was flat and dry. The only way to get to that rock is from the water. Mm-hmm. So nobody had been on that rock. There was no tracks, no water, just me sitting on that rock. To this day, the only thing I can say is God saved my life. Right. I, I feel like I experienced the, you know, the keeping power of God, but also the love and the mercy of God you were talking about earlier. And right. uh, he, there's a scripture that it reminds me of where you know, God's kindness is intended to bring us to places of repentance. Right. I know that's a paraphrase of Romans 2, uh, 4. Mm-hmm. But uh, that was that was quite an experience. Yes, it was, Mike. And, you know, we last program uh, we had Cheryl share with us, and she had a situation where she was underwater. And one of the, the verses that uh, I shared with her, I thought of, was Psalms 124, and it says, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, then the waters would have overwhelmed us and swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Uh, But we are like a bird escaped from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord. And and I can't help think how that applies to you. The the waters uh, were overwhelming you. You would have been swept away. And, And as Psalm 124 says, if it had not been the Lord... It, 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 but for the Lord, now Israel say, and I know that's your heart, but for the Lord, and, and you would not be here. You would have been swept away. And, swept away. You know, it's sure. amazing, Mike, how uh, at that time in your life, you just, your, your whole life flashed before you. Those mm-hmm. are the times when um, God wants us to turn our hearts to him. And, and even God warns us not to do things that we do, and we're, we're still in spite of us, God has mercy on us. Yes. God will lead us if we'll listen to him, and we'll totally avoid all of these situations. Really? But, but in our uh, rebellion, in our willfulness of just not listening to him and doing what we want to, exactly. uh, when we go astray, all of these things happen to us that are destructive. Yes. Um, but isn't it amazing how God had mercy on you and totally. God has mercy on me in the midst of that? And because, Mark, when I look back at that, I wasn't living for God. I wasn't walking with God. I knew about God, and I definitely had a place in my heart for God. But I did what I wanted to do, when I wanted to do it, the way I wanted to do it. Right. I, I, had, no, I had no real relationship with Him at all. Right. Well, I'm so glad that God had mercy on you in the midst of your state and grabbed you by the arm and lifted yes, you up. So, absolutely. Mike, thank you for sharing. Powerful testimony. Thank we you for having it. Me. And so we're going to have Phil come next, and Phil is going to share with us how God uh, saved his life. And uh, Phil, you had a very serious situation that I just learned about. You were sharing with me before, and uh, uh, very close to death. You could have died. Could have uh, died. And uh, you're here by the mercy of God, too. So yes. tell us about it. Well, I was a, a heavy equipment mechanic as a profession. I was working on a very large uh, mining truck. Uh, it was large enough that uh, some portions of it you could walk underneath. I was working underneath it, walk underneath it. I was working on it, and for some reason I stood up real quick, uh, and it was uh, 
and I went straight to the ground there was a lot of pain I hit my head on on a brace or a fender or something and uh, I laid there for a while and the, the somebody from the rock quarry come over to check on me and I said yeah I'm okay I started having a lot of headaches um, and uh, and a lot of sleepless nights the pain just got really severe uh, I, I started seeing a lot of doctors uh, neurologists and all kinds of specialists and regular doctors and even uh, uh, chiropractors trying to get the pain to relief. Uh, of all the MRIs and other scans, they said that one of the doctors said that uh, he that he could indicate that indicated that I was a heavy alcohol drinker. And I, I don't, I don't know. I didn't think too much about it. He said my brain was twenty five percent smaller than it should be. Hmm. And uh, so, I. Uh, going through all the doctors, my wife had heard from God that she needed to be taking notes, who I saw, wh when I saw, and, and what their diagnosis was. And the pain uh, kind of eased up. I went on a business trip out of town. The, uh, with the pain about halfway through the week, the pain returned, and it just got so severe I couldn't stand it. So I could come home. Um, but God protected me. I, I know it was. I didn't know it, realize it then because... I remember getting in a taxi cab. I, I somehow got home. I changed planes. Uh, I only remember, I don't remember paying the taxi cab driver. I do remember he took the long way to the airport. Uh, I, I, don't, I remember vaguely being in an airport somewhere. The next thing I knew was I was at home in the, in the airport. Um, for some reason, my boss was there waiting on me, took me home. Uh, my, my, I had, my wife thought I needed to go to the dentist, so she took me to the dentist. I have no recollection of that. The pain was, was kept, and she could say, okay, we're going shopping, and I would just, I'd get up and I'd follow her. Uh, Friday, though, I didn't wake up. Hmm. I wasn't waking up, and she started calling all the doctors. They said, you need to go to the ER, and uh, she, she inquired. She was the one that was following Jesus, not me. Mm -hmm. And uh, she took me to the hospital that, uh, that God told her to take me to. The ER doctor thought I was faking. Uh, I was very, and uh, so she said, wait a minute. She went out to the car and she happened to have her notes. She gave them the notes and then they decided to get their neurologists involved. And their neurologist said, we have to have, he has to have emergency surgery now or, uh, or he's going to die. And it was a subdural hematoma, mm -hmm. like a blood blister on the inside. It was producing pressure. Right. And what they did to, to do is they had to drill a hole in the back of your head about the size of a quarter mm -hmm. or a nickel. And um, the, it went to, they drilled on the wrong side of the head to start with. But I, I, knew that at, at, I knew the pain was gone after surgery when I woke up in recovery. Uh, and I know that God saved me. It didn't change my life, but I knew that God was a part of it. And um, the neurologist, after the surgery, said, I know the alcohol didn't cause this situation. Said, but if you don't stop the alcohol, the al alcohol will kill you. Right. And so uh, God saved me from the, the head injury, and uh, I quit drinking alcohol. And I think it was God's providence that... Uh, uh, had the neurologist tell me that, right. that I needed to stop. Right, and the and subdural hematoma. You and I were talking about this the other day, and and actually, uh, you 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 got me curious about it, and I did some research on it, and and first thing that comes up is that that is one of the most deadly hematomas there is. Yes. Uh, people die from that. Yes. Uh, and you could have died from that. You, obviously, the the pressure was great, and and so I, I know God spared your life. Uh, and if you didn't get in there and get that pressure relief, you could have been dead. Yeah, it could have been. And so I'm so thankful to hear that. And, you know, it's amazing how your wife, uh, thankfully, she was um, praying and asking yes. God and serving God. Isn't that good to know? And it is good to know. Of course, I know um, God drew your heart years later. Yes. And isn't it amazing how you can look back after you come to God, you look back at your life and you say, I should have been dead. Yes. God, you were watching over me in the midst of me, totally away from you. Yeah. Isn't that good? And, and he, he led me to, because my, I followed my wife here to Spindell and Word of Faith Fellowship. Right. And and uh, everything I've learned is, it has uh, changed my life. That's great. It made everything better. That's great. Well, Phil, thank you so much for sharing. I'm so glad you're here with us and God saved your life. So. 
And so we have one person left with uh, who's going to share, and that's Stephen Geary. And uh, Stephen has a powerful testimony too. Uh, Stephen actually has been on the radio program, and he shared his testimony. And and I asked him to come back because uh, Stephen, you've had so many near death experiences that. I don't even know if I can keep up with all of the near-death experiences. And you and I talked, and and uh, so uh, specifically, Stephen, why don't you share with us? Start off with I know the time when you were in um, Ecuador. Is that right? Yes, sir. And uh, you were doing things out of the will of God, as as we've heard from others here today. Um, but yet God had mercy on you. So share That's with right. us about it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for coming. Uh, all right, keeping me. And yes, I want to share. Um, well, I have several experiences that was close to death. So, but this one is specific. Uh, I'm from Ecuador and uh, from Quito. So Quito is um, very high elevations. So it's about 10,000 feet high. So my brother was involved in rafting. So he was, uh, he was doing, um, guiding people to do rafting and kayak. So in these specific situations was a weekend. So he invited me to do rafting with him. But um, so he said, is um, a young man from United States came. He's an expert. He's going to show us uh, some some tricks with the kayak. So I I went with him. So I I was uh, measuring involving sports and stuff. I I, I thought I was I, I can handle anything. So I went there without knowing nothing about kayaks. So it was my first experience in the river and this river particular river is pretty high you you understand it, it comes from the top of the mountains to sea level in about uh, 40 miles so it's, it's a very fast river and in that time of the year was pretty uh, a rainy season so it was very was a lot of water it was very fast so sure enough this young man uh, he gave me his uh, his suit so i it was a Belcher suit. You Belcher your your wrist, your uh, uh, your feet, and then your tie here. So I sure enough, I jump in. He jumped first, and I jumped behind him, and I was not even uh, five hundred feet in the water when I I flip because I mean this river was so fast and uh, you know it was rocks the size of this room covered with water. So when you go over the water, you know, create these, these, uh, waterfalls. So I, I didn't make it. So I, I, I flip and I was, uh, try to keep myself in my back, you know, steering. Cause this was a wide river. It was about 150 feet wide. So I'm pretty fast. So I was coming down the river. So I tried to steer myself to try to go to the shore. At that point, you know, I was uh, considered a good swimmer, but I started getting water inside the suit. So I was very heavy. My I could not move myself pretty well. So, uh, so he, this young man, came and tried to help me. He came, he, he came back and he let me grab a hold of his kayak in the back. So I was kind of holding there, but it was so fast. The thing was, I mean, is crazy i mean and he and also the the kayak that was on the kayak went like a arrow down down the hill so he was concerned about the kayak because it was not his kayak it was somebody else's kayak so he he did the best he could to help me but he flew behind the, his kayak so i was i was hitting the rocks and hitting my elbows my knees my sh everywhere my, I mean, I was trying to protect my head out of the hitting the rocks, but mm -hmm. at some point I was uh, able to, was a huge rock was coming up. So I was able to, because I was flat, you know, laying in my back, I was able to put my feet against the rock. But the force of the water, I mean, flipped me. I mean, I flew and I was in that point, I was coming down this way and rolling in the rocks. Mm -hmm. And I, in that point, uh, I, I saw, I did, that's it. I said, I'm going to die. But I give you a little background here, Mark, because, you know, I was living a sinful life. I was involved in so many things. This particular thing was, uh, I was involved in 
witchcraft. You know, I was going to see a, a witch doctor. So he, he would become a good friend because he was, you know, tell me the future and tell me all these things, how to protect myself, how to do this, this, that. So in uh, one of these visits to him, he gave me a, a lucky, you know, a little charm for lucky. Right. So I will always keep it with me. So, but in this point, I was coming down the river and I, I, I had lost it. I said, this is it. I'm going to die today so so I, I reach out with my hand to see my little little uh, thing mm -hmm. and was gone so and the first talk to my mind came to my mind and said forget it this thing it didn't work anyway yeah. so I I didn't know Jesus I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus at all Do you know I grew up in a family not knowing God so but in that point of desperation, I said, God, help me. It's the only thing I remember. I said, God, help me. And even I was rolling my head down. And few few seconds later, I saw this, uh, I believe was a part of a, a tree, a, a root that was sticking out of. And I was well able to hold on to that. So I came out of the, the river. So and literally I unhooked myself out of the, and then water was, I mean, it was, my hands were, my right. arms were full of water. My, of course, I was bruised all over, you know. The thing about this, Marga, you know, what I, I saw in that point, at least, you know, I, 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 I quit going to see this witch doctor, right. you know. Be, uh, you know, looking looking back now, I can see the hand of God. You know, God wants right. to bring His attention to me. I said, "Hey, I, I'm going to prove to you right. that I'm." But I didn't see that. But at least you know, God God knew that I was going to be able to say, "I'm not going to do any more this witchcraft stuff." Right. Right. So um, you know, I I I was able to come out of that. You know, of course. You know, in the back of my mind, always I thought, I'm lucky. You know, one more time, because I have several experiences that I was lucky, but now looking back, was God, the mercy of God in my life. Right. Do you know, He didn't allow for me to die that right. day because I was going straight to hell. All right. And, you know, you, know, you and I know you shared with me, um, and we don't have time today, but I know even you were hit by a car during that time in your life uh, when you were in Ecuador and uh, like you said your whole life was just uh, doing whatever you wanted to do I, I know you shared with me before you were a successful businessman and, and away from God and um, even when you were hit by a car it, it was amazing that you were alive I think you exactly. said the car was 50 miles per yes. hour and hit you on a sidewalk and yeah. and you flew in the air and, and, and it's amazing you're here today after all the things you went through and God's hand was on your life, the protecting power of God. And uh, right. I know the rest of your testimony is amazing how God drew you eventually. And here you are, and you, yeah. you love God and serving God. So um, I have a scripture, Mark, that yes. I want to share because I was reading last night and uh, brought my attention to this scripture. It's in uh, Ecclesiastes. It says that uh, part of it is Ecclesiastes 8 8 says, There is no man who has power over the spirit to retain the bread of life, neither has the power over the day of death. Mm. And that tells me God is in right. control. I mean, even in my weakness, yes. he has control of my life. Yes, very powerful. And thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, it's been an amazing uh, three programs now we've covered. And if you would like to hear the other two programs where we covered people who are miraculously saved from near-death experiences, you can actually go to our website, and that is wordoffaithfellowship.org, and we have all our radio programs there, and they are videoed so you can watch them and, and see everybody and hear amazing love of God, amazing power and protection of God that's been on everyone's life. So uh, thank you again. We're on this program Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, 8.30 to 9.00. I hope that you'll continue to listen. We, we have so enjoyed sharing with you the powerful work that God has done in our lives. So thank you and have a great day.